Peko Banyaya. Why are you the way that you are? All that and more on Motorsport 101. To be fair, he's not wrong, folks. He's not wrong at all. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 432 of Motorsport 101. I'm your friendly neighborhood host, Dre Harrison. And uh, don't cry for Bez Argentina, because this was a uh, epic MotoGP weekend in one sense of the word. And we, we but Round two of the championship, Argentina, the Argentine Grand Prix, um, a ridiculous sprint and a slightly tame but equally dominant Grand Prix fixture it's good to be back in Argentina. It's great to see the, the bikes around here again. I do love this place. And uh, we got a brand new winner in the top flight. And uh, boy, did he ride out of his skin. We'll get to him in just a minute. But first of all, let's go around the horn. First up, he's been cooking with gas in anger regarding Francesco Bagnai for the last three days now. It's Cam Buckley. Hello, sir. I feel like I'm, I'm cooking with straight napalm at the entire state of bike racing. Um... I mean, I, I, what's worse, throwing away that second place, or as you may notice, there were no Repsol Hondas in the race. None. None. Well, again, we'll get to the reasons as to why that is in just a minute. Um, it was a lot. Uh, <laughs> and not in a good way either, because the sprint claimed another victim um, while we were too busy celebrating Brad Binder doing some ridiculous shit. Also, we got RJ O'Connell. Hello, RJ. Oh, what's up? What's up, gang? This is our third episode we're recording this week. And we still got one more to go. <laughs> I've got two more. <laughs> oh, yeah, because Kick Out Cab's helping Zoe out with her new show. Do check that out once it comes out. We'll give it a plug properly when it's up in full. Um, because we, because we're, uh, we're out here expanding the Motorsport 101 universe. <laughs> it's a terrifying thought for all involved. But uh, in this heated edition of Motorsport 101 for MotoGP in Argentina, we'll be talking about Bez and his happy Monday. Uh, because uh, Bez, our new Grand Prix winner and new championship leader, Marco Bezzecchi, championship leader. That's an actual thing. Ah! <laughs> exactly as the form book predicted. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly j just how the form book drew it up. Like, I don't know how anybody didn't see this one coming, quite frankly. Uh, we'll get into that. We'll get into the sprint and Brad Binder passed all the fucking bikes, all of them, uh, over the course of uh, 12 laps of a slightly damp Argentina. Um, 12 laps? He overtook all of them by about the fifth corner more or less oh my god we'll get into that we'll let cam cook on the frustrations of being a francesco bagnaia fan um because guess what folks he crashed again because my man can't do it easy and we'll be talking a little bit more about some of the wild stewarding standards at all so uh that'll be a fun one um because why would steve o'donnell do this <laughs> I think our new running bit has to be, why would Michael Massey do this every time something dumb happens in MotoGP? And every time something dumb happens in F1, we have to ask, why did Freddie Spencer do this? I like that. I think, I think that is going to be our new bit. I think that is going to be our new bit. So, places you can find us all quick. We're on Twitter at motorsport underscore 101. You can follow our handles personally, if you like, at Dre underscore WTF1, at cbuckley917, and at RJ O'Connell. Uh, if you like to follow us on Instagram, you can at motorsport101 pod for all the latest episode news and what have you. And, of course, you can get all of that on our website, motorsport101.com, including all the race reviews from yours truly regarding this past epic weekend uh, i.e formula one in australia moto gp in argentina and indy cars ppg 375 um there's a lot going on there and a lot to break down and a lot of good and bad and it's 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 a fun time so do go over there if you haven't already do check that out and of course if you really like us you can back us financially on patreon patreon.com forward slash motorsport one one five bucks lets you early access to all of our shows 10 gets you in the support us come by discord server you can listen to these episodes live as they're being recorded say hi in the chat if you're listening in uh, chip in you know you might even get some thoughts on the show who knows that would be fun without basically further... how i ended up here yeah yeah more or less um so without further ado let's get into moto gp's gp of argentina <laughs> 
Marco Bezzecchi dominated the Grand Prix of Argentina, leading from almost start to finish in heavy, wet conditions. At one point, he had as much as a seven-second lead from his fellow Ducati riders as Johan Zarco would come through the field yet again to take second, with Alex Marquez continuing his good run of form in third. It was not only the third rider of the VR46 Academy to win in the Premier Class, it was also the first for Valentino Rossi's Mooney VR46 team. They're on the board officially. Um, my God, if you, if you saw the celebrations, yellow flares after after podiums in the sprint and then in the race itself. It was it was like we've gone back to 2003 again. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a nice little throwback, if I do say so myself. Right. How impressive was Bez's win, gentlemen? And can the VR46 team challenge for the title? Oh, man, he he looked he looked like he's been at this for a long, long time. Um, talk about degree of difficulty. Really poor conditions on race day for all three classes, but especially MotoGP. Um, he took the lead and he never looked back. <laughs> He really was like that. Like he, he, he started, you know, on the front row. But by the t- he led by turn one because more than he went ride, and then he was he wasn't touched again. He, like he, he broke out from the first t- from the on. first two corners. And, oh, hang on. Franco Morbidelli. <laughs> Franco Morbidelli is back. You are not part of all your yet. God. Are Honestly, you, are you trying to break our ears, Opal? I'm Again. just, I'm so, I'm so happy because you know. MotoGP is legitimately a better sport when Franco Morbidelli is back to full health and can be competitive. I was looking in the chat and Jason just died. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, like, God, Franco Morbidelli was at the front. Franco Morbidelli led this weekend. He did. Franco Morbidelli was was Ugh. comfortably way better than Fabio Quadraro as well. Um, it, it looks like we might have discovered something about Frankie post injury. It looks like in low grip conditions, he is every bit as good as he was. Weird, very weird. Because like most tracks that have high grip scenarios, Fabio is crushing Morbidelli left, right, and center. But all weekend, because Argentina, we don't race around the Termas Rio del Hondo very often. The last time we'd raced anything had raced around that circuit was last July. So we've gone, <coughs> pardon me, we've gone nine months since anything raced on that track. So it was extremely dusty. And then it rained on Friday night and that washed all the dust off. And it just, it just became a, 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 to, a, a various degrees of wet race over the course of the weekend. And, it more but that he was just really really goddamn good and rj's absolutely right like we've said it before on this show more but that is one of the few genuinely great people in bike racing um he's been a huge champion of social causes he's um you know been very vocal in saying that lewis hamilton is one of his heroes and that he wants to try and take some of the mantle where where he's left off in formula one and apply it to moto gp a sport that's often quite ignorant to, to said social issues he he is a delightful uh rider he's a and, good egg it's a good egg, and i think i speak on behalf of everybody here when we're all rooting for him to find some form again and i hope this wasn't just a blip. Um, we had to get that tangent in because we do like Frankie on this show, and Frankie's very much said relax this weekend. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> back, back to the regularly scheduled program. I mean, Bez, Bez, Marco Bezzecchi. Um, this has this. been coming. Hmm. This yeah. has been coming for a little bit because late last year, not he was really solid, and there was some flashes where you think this kid's good. Mm. I mean, rookie of the year for a reason. And then, I mean, he looked like a pig in mud in the wet conditions. Um, all per- perfectly executing the dance. The bike is moving around; it's on the limit, but it's never over. And there was nothing that the chasing pack of Alex Marquez, who, by the way, got pole position, second race on a Ducati, and uh, Pecco, there was nothing they could do with him. No, absolutely nothing. It was, it was like I said. Took the lead first corner, took off, 
couldn't touch him again for the rest of the race. He was ridiculous. It was at one point he was seven seconds clear. No one was anywhere near him. It was it was just buttery smooth and and it was it was so so good to watch. Honestly, you know you know what's funny when I, when I was watching this race and when he got off the bike and when he took his helmet off afterwards and it it suddenly hit me what what this all reminded me of Marco Simoncelli. It was just. Because he even looks like Marco Simicelli. If he, if he, when, when the hair falls out of the helmet when he takes it's, it it's off. Like, it's, like, it's like, oh, it, it hit me right in the feels, let me tell you. I was just like, oh, that you remind me of Marco. You really remind me of Marco because he was also very, very good in the rain himself. Mm. Um, oh, just, just, just the flashpoint as it entered my head. I was like, oh, wow, that was um, that was special. That was, Marco would have been proud of that one, let me tell you. Um, oh, the, very impressive first win. Very incredible. Like you'll be hard pushed to find a better performance this year on two wheels. That was incredible. Um, Dude, when at, when uh, fucking when Johan Zarco got past Alex Marquez for second, uh, but uh, Bezeki was already six seconds up the road. I was I was talking about this before we went on a show today with other people because we were asking like who are the championship contenders in MotoGP, and I know we've had a very small sample size, but why can't it be Marco Bezeki fighting for a championship? The sample size is small, but there there is this trend. I mean, he look, he was superb opening weekend in Portugal. Mm. Um, got the podium. It was kind of in a chasm between, you know, Peco and Maverick Vinales kind of they kind of just effed off at the front, um, chasing each other away from the pack. And then Bezeki was well clear of everyone behind him. Um, it's not like this isn't on merit. And He's on last year's Ducati. This year's Ducati isn't that different, really. Um, it's still a hell of a motorcycle. Um, but the sample size is small. Trey, we were kind of talking about this before we went on air. And mm. what do you think is the sample size where we can think, okay, maybe Bezeki has his foot in the door here for a title push? I would say maybe Le Mans and yeah. what and the one month break that comes afterwards because that's round five and that'll be a it'll be a good sample size because you'll have Texas which is a very different sort of track very anti clockwise very free flowing um, sort of motorcycle track then you've got Haref which is a lot more technical um, a lot of medium speed corners. Um, and then Le Mans, which again, quite technical, a lot of undulation, kind of a good um, mix at Le Mans. Yeah. It, it's, it's an, it's very much an, it's the everything bagel of tracks. It has fast flowing section. I mean, it's, it is partially comprised of circuit de la Sarthe. Mm. Um, but then you dip into the Bugatti circuit with the, the motorcycle track and there is a really good mix there. Um, definitely it, it, it it shows up the faults in a rider and a bike. And I agree with you. I think if he can maintain how he's looking right now, you know, podium, he hasn't, he hasn't been off the podium so far. He was also, he finished second in the sprint as well, um, which we'll get to the sprint result in a little bit. Um, if he can maintain that through round five, there's no reason for me to think he can't maintain this for longer. Yeah, it's it's a good mix. I mean, it's hard to say overall because, like, I know RJ's alluded to it, and I can only echo the sentiment. It's hard to get a read on everything in the field right now because uh, let's not forget a quarter of the field missed this race. <laughs> you yeah. know, and we lost and I, uh, we lost Johan Mir yeah. from mm. uh, a big crash in the, the sprint, um, all on his own, lost the bike. Has head and neck injuries. Nothing broken, but yeah, bad. Se severe concussion um, was what the reports were. Reporting nausea um, when he got back to the track on Sunday morning, still thinking he had a shot of racing because MotoGP is a silly sport for silly people. Do not say, do it. Th thank God he got declared unfit because there's oh, no, Jesus. there was no way. I mean, the could the dude couldn't walk straight. <laughs> out on the spot when you diagnose when you list him as a severe concussion i don't know i mean i'm not in charge of dorna i'm not in charge of race direction i'm not in charge of the medical team but i figure if you list it as a severe concussion i'm like thinking yeah we're not even doing a special evaluation he's not racing 
Well, yeah. well, he was he the there's two separate medical teams in this situation being those at the hospital. I mean, he was sent straight to hospital mm. um, from the crash due to just he was in a horrific state. And then uh, MotoGP's doctors have to clear or not clear you shouldn't yes. really be necessary. But obviously they saw that he was not fit for purpose. Yeah, I was going to say, MotoGP has no straight-up concussion protocol, unfortunately. So, like it's other quite sports, unacceptable, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, for a sport at this level of this magnitude, I I don't know why that's not mandatory at this point. You like if like if in in rugby, if you have any even inkling of a head injury, you're immediately taken off the field, and if they diagnose you with a concussion, you are not allowed to play any sort of form of the game for seven days. Like I, yeah. I don't, I, I don't understand why, why MotoGP, especially in a sport where you are much more susceptible to head injuries compared to most sports, I do not understand why we don't have a, a, a basic concussion protocol. The Isle of Man TT does. There's no reason why MotoGP can't. Quite frankly, where is the bar? Subterranean. The bar. The bar is at the Isle Man Tourist Trophy, the the single most dangerous motorcycle road race. Exactly. Has higher has higher medical standards for participation than MotoGP. It's a, it's it's quite alarming. Get well soon, yeah, man. Hopefully he'll be back on a bike soon in a hundred at a hundred percent. And yeah, like I said, c- c- congrats to Bez. Like I said, he is now championship leader, um, which is a sentence I didn't think I'd be saying three weeks ago, but here we are. Um, what I would say in response to the title contender talk is. He's got every chance. We saw last year was the walking case study. Enea Bastianini on last year's Ducati, which the first half of the year in particular was a lot smoother and a lot easier to ride than the hybrid um, engine mix that Ducati had in their factory bike. And I, I, I called him Baby Banyaya because his ceiling wasn't quite as high, but his floor wasn't quite as low. But it, Bastianini stuck around for most of the season as a title contender all the way through. Now, I don't know if Bez is ready to take that kind of step forward where he's going from, you know, top six finisher, occasional podium, um, to genuinely challenging for wins. Ducati is a minefield. We've got a lot of riders to come back as well, like Mark Marquez, Johan Mir, and Aya Bastianini, who is aiming to be back for Austin in two weeks' time. You know, we're, like the true makeup of the field, we just don't know really yet, and that's where we're going. Like I said, I think by Le Mans, I think we'll have a much clearer picture of where the field is. Hopefully, if people stay healthy. But as RJ alludes to, I don't see any reason why he can't do this if he keeps up this current run of form. He's, he's fast. He's fast as all hell. I mean, two two main race podiums in a row, one of which being a win, a sprint race podium. It's and, a good and, start. It's, it's, it's not a bad sample size. It's not the biggest, but it ain't bad. Prove that you can do this week in and week out. And exactly. Bastianini was able to do it for longer than I think a lot of people expected last year. And, and right now you have, have contention because right now you have to wonder. You have to wonder, like, don't take the Yamaha's VR46. Don't do it. Mm. On that note, uh, this was a fun stat from Mark that was pulled by Martin Reigns at MotoGP. Mark, before the MotoGP race today, the last time that the Premier Class podium consisted of three satellite team riders on bikes from the same manufacturer, the 1996 Malaysian Grand Prix, Carlos Checa in third, Alex Barros in second, Luca Catalora, your race winner. And this was pre Sepang. Oh, yeah. And all on uh, all on Honda NSRs back when Honda knew how to put a bike together. Mm, no kidding. How about how about the glow up from this VR46 team who le- one leadership ago was was the one MotoGP team that you didn't want to sign up for? Ah, uh, yes. Ugh. Let, 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 let's not let's not forget as well. Um, the <laughs> what's the some you word in this? Like at one point, like. <laughs> These guys are still considering going to the Yamaha next year. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Do not do it. They're, apparently, there's talk Valentino wants them on the Yamaha's giving his brand ambassador for them. Screw that. 
like v- valley. Uh, if, if you uh, if you listen, if you listen, okay, if, don't do it. I I talked at length with this with a friend of the show during the week, and there is upside to it. I mean, if they can effectively become what Tech Three are to KTM, and that they are less a satellite and more a second factory team. There is an upside to it, but the Ducati's just too good, Dre. It's just too good of a bike. And when you see Yamaha, I mean, Yamaha are rotting on the vine right now. Mm. Uh, don't don't let Morbidelli's brilliant weekend fool you. I mean, Fabio Quattararo got, in his own words, tackered off the start. But he had qualified down that low to be in that position to get tackered. Because the bike just isn't, it's just no good. It's not even that slow in a straight line. It's just not all that fast around the lap anymore. It's it's rough out here, man. It is rough out here. Oh, should we get to talk about, to talk about the sprint a little bit, folks? Uh, all right. Um, everyone open. And praise be to the Lord. Brad Bender. <laughs> he of the mighty turn one send. <laughs> well, you wanted to call this the passion of the Christ. The passion of the bender. If we were still doing silly episode names, that's what we should call it. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. This weekend saw another exciting sprint race that was won from 14th on the grid by the Lord himself, Brad Bender. He went from essentially from last to first as he took the lead by lap three and held it out to the final corner with the VR6 boys trying to gun him down. How nuts was this? Oh, that was Brad Bender. I mean, Brad Bender's performance of the sprint. I watched that. That was that was astonishing. It might be the greatest first turn I have ever witnessed as a motorsport fan. No hyperbole. Uh, I, it was mm. that dive bomb into turn one on F1 2013 where the AI jump out of your way and you go from last to fourth in about two corners. He st- what he started fifteenth. <laughs> he started in the middle of the pack. He started in the back of the pack, and he still won the sprint. Yeah, only eighteen dudes started that sprint, so he was back of the fifth row. Um, he passed nine bikes in the first quarter. He just hugged the ins- He just hugged the inside of the turn one white line and just parked it there. And every and it's like Moses parting the Red Sea. Yeah, I mean, it was it was there's there's, there's a just reference there for you. Um, yeah, Jesus Christ, this was ridiculous. Um, uh, like I've said it before, in MotoGP, if you get lucky and the corner allows it, sometimes you can cheat a little bit by going around the outside. I've seen Alex Rins do this a couple of times, where they take oh, this yeah. really long sweeping outside line, and you get lucky because obviously people bunch up people sit the bike up if you go the long way around you can get away with it sometimes right yeah like, but dre that that's on the corner speed demon suzuki mm. where you could get away with that he swung his ktm to the inside hugged the white line and the bike held oh yeah oh yeah it was it was it was perfection like to have that level of confidence and bravery when you don't really know how much grip you have when you push in that first push lap that first corner you, you you're you're kind of crossing your fingers and praying to god the bike doesn't slip out from underneath you because any wrong move and you're taking out half the field here and, yeah. and, and, and binder was inch perfect he was inch perfect he nailed it and he came out of that sixth by turn three he was basically fourth it, it was absolutely ridiculous um it, it was a video game move it's the second time in two years we've talked about a video game move on this podcast Oh, yeah. And damn it, it was. Golden Melon might be locked down already this year. Somebody's got to do something insane for the rest for the rest of these eight months to surpass that. It's like it's like we to be fair, we said that about Antonio Felix da Costa off the full Marie in Cape Town. And it, it took us yeah, less than Brad a month. Shot all over him. It took us less than a month for that to be topped. I, I, I don't understand how it happened that quick. Um, but again, here we are. Motorsport works in strange and mysterious ways. And like, he, he got it absolutely spot on. The KTM has is not a great bike for tire wear. Binder pushed like hell. 
And again, like, it's funny. He was 0.7 of a second in front with two to go. And then the gap evaporated over those final two laps. Bez and Marini got their skates on and was like, okay, he's, he's okay. We've had enough. Let's get him. Um, and <laughs> that's basically what happened. And Binder ended up winning it by a nose. It was 0. 0.07 over the line with, I think it was Luca Marini behind him in second. And oh, Bez. That was Bez, actually. So Bez was second as well. So, yeah, Bez had a really good weekend. He only three points off perfection. Um, but, yeah, Bez and Marini right behind him, second and third. Um, and, yeah, double podium for the, for the PR46 team. And then, again, getting Bez to win the race. What a weekend they had. And But yeah, I love the fact that Jack Miller celebrated with him after the race was over, after the sprint race was over. And if you hear the amount of F-bombs that Jack Miller said, because he couldn't believe what he'd just seen... <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, you see v- videos of people wa- re-watching it, riders re-watching it, and their eyes are beach balls. It's like, huh? What? How? Oh, just absolutely ridiculous racing. And B- Brad Binder just has a knack for this. He really does. Um, it, it, it is a shame he's on the equipment that he's on because, I mean, again, another weekend where – it feels like KTM turns the corner and then they f- crater right back down into the ground. They've turned the uh, corner and the, and the corner is right into a nosedive. Pretty much. I mean, it, it, it's it's the fact that they're inconsistent with no pattern. They Oh, this place will suit KTM well, and then they're terrible. This place won't suit KTM well. They're fighting for podiums. They've turned and, the corner and the giant hand from that jackass skit is, is there to greet them <laughs> right in the face. <laughs> No kidding. And I mean, unfortunately, main race didn't go that great. He got cleaned the fuck out by Maverick Vinales. Yep. Uh, no penalty somehow. Uh, f- why would Michael Massey do this? More on that in a bit. <laughs> More on that on our previous episodes. Um, yeah, Aprilia were dog water this weekend. They, that bike does not work in the wet at all. Yeah, I remember seeing Elise get, Elise get off at the end of the Grand Prix pissed. Um, even more pissed than usual because Elise is a very angry man in general. But uh, he was not happy at the fact that uh, that, that, uh, that, that Aprilia was just not there um, at all on this one. Brutal to see. but uh, um, They started the weekend looking like, you know, dominant contenders. I mean, they were they were topping practice sessions. Um, they I were remember, fighting, and then as yeah, soon as the rain came down heavy, they were just nowhere. Yeah, like you got to remember, they won here last year with Alicia Spargaro, and, and they broke uh, through. Yeah, Aprilia have always been really good in low grip conditions. Like Alicia said, look, it's not that we're better; it's just we're less bad than everybody else on low grip. Um, and which I thought was <laughs> that hilarious. Just kind of sum up. I just kind of sum up anyone's day. Yeah, it's not that we were good; it's that we sucked less than everyone else. Yeah, it works. It works. Um, so yeah, like that was that was a prettiest weekend in a nutshell. Um, Cam, I've held I've held off no longer on this one for you. Talk to me about Francesco Bagnaia. Just uh, let me just let me just open my bottle of Everclear. It was another race of frustration for reigning and defending. World champion Francesco Bagnaia. But the was, thing is, is that it wasn't. He crashed out of second place, which means he was in second place with seven laps to go. Francesco Bagnaia made another familiar mistake. And fun fact, this is the sixth time since the start of last season, 22 races and since two sprints ago, that he's crashed out of a race. Cam, I know Ugh. this is your guy. How big is the problem is this for him going forward? Francesco Bagnaia, why are you the way that you are? You are incredibly talented. You can make the Ducati turn. You can pass some fucking bikes. You can do it all. Why are you the way that you are? Why is it that every time you're in a situation where you just got to knuckle down, just take a good points day, you decide to be a silly fucker and throw the bike up the road? I, 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 it, it boggles my mind because last year under enormous pressure, 
where he had to basically win out for most of the second half of the season of his own volition because he kept crashing in the first half. He held up to incredible pressure with really only a couple mistakes to finish out the year. That was amazing. That was that was he was amazing. He, he did the greatest comeback in MotoGP history. And yet, why is he the way that he is, Dre? He can't stand prosperity. Um, I've said before, I think he lacks discipline. I, I've always said that I think he lacks discipline and I think he loses concentration sometimes. In, in he, He's not a thinking man's rider. Andrea De Vizioso would be cringing at this man right now. <laughs> Andrea De Vizioso. Andrea De Vizioso would be out pointing this man on this bike if he were still in his prime, just by virtue of not crashing. Just look, what I will say is this. Statistically, this is the sixth time that Francesco Bagnaia has crashed in a Premier Class race since the start of last season. That's 22 races and two sprints. That's almost a 25% rate. In fact, it is exactly 25% if you include the two sprints. Crash a, a quarter. I said, and, and I, said, I said I said before as well. Last year he was the first world champion ever in the MotoGP era to win with five DNFs under his record. He was very lucky that the man didn't have a top contender consistently throughout the whole season. Well, well, the problem is Dre, and you ta- we've talked about it before, is that his main contenders in this situation don't have effective bikes to take the fight to him. Fabio Quartararo, the the Yamaha just melted away in the second half of last year. Fabio was having to tie the bike into knots to get it into the top 10 sometimes. Um, And this year, Fabio's nowhere. The Yamaha's nowhere. They are not title contenders as far as I'm concerned. They're dreadful. There is an event horizon glowing around Mark Marquez as he is trying to bludgeon the honda into cooperation and it is hurting him and it is incidentally it's hurting other people at this point the and honda is beyond his powers for the time being and there's no other proven combination of rider and ducati that's been able to put together a full season of performances yet no. except for maybe an a bastianini and he has missed the first two weekends well well and an a bastianini is also as you said in the last segment baby banyaya he is he doesn't quite have that raw edge on just sheer lap time that Peko seems to be able to generate. But he also isn't quite as crash prone, but he's still crash prone. He is everything Peko is, just slightly less so. Bez, as we talked about at length earlier, we need a bigger sample size. So far, it looks good. What's that going to look like you know, a month from now, two months from now? And, I mean, it doesn't matter anyway with Anea because he got wiped out by Marini and his miss, he scored nothing from the first weekend. He wasn't here. He's trying to aim to be back at Coda. We'll kind of see where that goes. Um, it's... Benyaya is very, very lucky right now that he's in the situation that he's in, that he can dump the bike being a silly fucker sometimes. And it's not going to punish him as much as it normally would. Yeah, because the rest but, of the, the rest the rest of the field's in a bar fight. There is no clear number two rider in this championship right now. No, it's we don't have a clear field yet because a quarter of it's gone right now. Um, and a lot of the number two riders, I would say, they're currently healing up and hoping to be back at Coda, if not later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, Mark Marquez put that piece of junk on pole. And if he was smart, he would have been taking the points, but pushed too hard, fucked up under braking, and crashed himself and two other riders out of the race. Um, Anaya's out. Mir, jeez, I hope he's okay fundamentally as a yeah. person right now. Yeah. Um, there is just, and we made this point in the F one episode talking about Red Bull's dominance. No one wins forever. Eventually, someone from whatever team, whether it's within Ducati's ranks or whether it's another manufacturer, when someone else starts putting it together, Peko needs to cut the bullshit. Because he's not going to get away with it forever. 
Jeez, man. And I am this dude's biggest fan. He is so entertaining to watch. But, I mean, even Alex Marquez, who he passed for second before he went down, somehow, I, don't, I don't know why he was pushing that hard. There was nothing to play for. Bez was, uh, at that point, six and a half seconds up the road. Bez is not a proven contender yet. Alex Marquez Correct. is not a proven contender yet. Alex and Marquez just got here. Alex Marquez just got here. Bez, is. this is the first season where Bez looks anything like a potential contender. 16 points. Hell, even 13 points if Johan Zarco still comes through like a madman at the end is fine. I say Johan Zarco has been looking low-key really good this year. The tire wear god himself. As long as they lie to him and tell him, never tell him that he's in first. <laughs> and that way he can't crash out of, the, out of a win. He might actually sneak a win. It might be the year. It might, we'll have to wait and see. It might, it might be the year for Zarko. But the they, point- they, they need to tell him that there's someone else. Like They need to tell him that like Valentino came back for one weekend through a time machine and he's 10 seconds down the road. Yeah, yeah, just chase him down. It's fine. But he's got a 10-second time penalty. It's fine. Um, but, uh, no, because that'll crash. <laughs> look, the, the, Banyaya is lucky. The field still hasn't established itself, and he dominated Portimao, and he, that will carry him for a month or two. The field still has to establish itself. There is no clear number two contender, and that's why this won't hurt Banyaya in the long run. Just like it was last year. Last year was exactly the same way. Like... As much as he made the comeback, you've got to remember that he was 91 points back from Fabio in the first place for a good reason. Well, and and even then, Fabio, is, is, I feel much the same way about Quadraro, where he is not this bulletproof force. He does, he can crack under pressure. And last year, he did dump the bike a couple times trying to ring everything he had left that the Yamaha had. And now Cordero is not even a factor because we all agree no. that outside of what Franco Morbidelli did this weekend, this Yamaha is not good. No, if you're on a Japanese motorcycle right now in MotoGP, you are on the struggle bus. Um, but I, but I mean, like this was a horrific weekend for Aprilia. If Aprilia actually get their shit together and they start cashing in on some of their potential, word to the Honda S2000, like. Pecco is not going to be able to get away with dumping the bike up the road every three or four races. There's 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 a lot there's a lot going on here with, with but that's with, on them, of course. Yeah. You, you need to execute right now. Aprilia might have a bike that is maybe that last little percentile away from Ducati. As much as we praise the GP twenty two and twenty three, and deservingly so, they are phenomenal Grand Prix bikes. Um, the Desmo Sedici has become the bike to have. But you need to execute. All your potential on paper doesn't matter if you don't execute. Now, let me get into some of the stewarding before we get out of here. Oh, well. not again. We oh, have yeah. We, ha- we have to do it because uh, <laughs> Stewards Watch is back for another week and there was some f- Funny shit going down in Argentina this week, and across all three classes like, um, that I want to talk about. First and foremost, on, on my on my shit list, because I'm getting my dander up about this. First of all, since when did overtaking bikes in a yellow flag zone only get you a one second time penalty? Wait, what? Huh? <laughs> that, yeah, like Fabio Quadraro got hit with a one second time penalty after the sprint finished because he passed under yellow flags. That happens in F one. You get the rule book slammed down on your head like it's something out of Berserk. That's at least that's, a, that's at least a five second penalty in F one. Easy. Like he, 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 he didn't even change his finishing position in the end. It was it was a redundant penalty. It's almost like the stewards forgot about it. It was like oh shit, he passed in the yellow. Quick, um, uh, uh, g- g- give him give him a second. Fuck it. Um, that that's what it felt like. Um. Uh, a Logan I, Sargent, a school of penalty administration. Yeah, it happened to someone during the Moto Three race. I can't remember who the name of it was, but someone overtook on the other flags in that race as well, and they, they were given a position drop. Um, I, I, it wasn't the it wasn't the uh, the the the, uh, the double long lap penalty that that's uh, that's also listed on here, was it? No, is this no. different. Is this it's different. It's different. No, no, no. This happened during the Moto Three race. 
Um, I can't remember who who, who the the rider was that got hit by it, but uh, the, like there was also one in that Moto Three race that surprised me. Ayumu Sasaki. This is a separate penalty entirely. He got a position drop for irresponsible riding for a shoulder barge where both riders stayed on their bikes. Hmm. So so a shoulder barge is now a penalty. Huh. Uh, Valentino Rossi has just had half of his championships stripped retroactively. <laughs> now, look, look. Mark Marquez is now a zero-time world champion. Look, look, look. Don't get me wrong. If there's one class that needs tougher scrutineering standards, it's Moto3. I, I, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not losing sight of that for a moment, and there's more on that in a minute. But shoulder bar- if, if shoulder barges are now getting penalized... Uh, as Neil Hodson said on commentary, you all might as well pack it up and go home. <sighs> yeah, I mean, look, block, block passing, which often involves basically shoulder charging someone out of the way, is, whether you agree with it or not, a cornerstone of motorcycle racing. Not just Grand Prix, but production-based, um, f- flat tracking, Thanks to dirt, Jason. Bike, yeah. dirt bike racing. Yeah, it was Salvador, yeah. Yeah, Dale Salvador, thanks. Yeah, David Salvador. Yeah, over, over to Cundi Yellow as he found the official list. Thank you, Jason. Um, yeah. It's just no. No, no, no. If someone goes down, then yes, absolutely. If it is really blatant, fine. Now, the but, big one from Moto3 that I want to get into here is that uh-huh. Scott Ogden was having a oh, career boy. day for the Vision Track team was running fourth going into the final lap and under hard braking towards turn four, the turn four hairpin, he locks his front tire. Stop me if you've heard this one before recently. Um, Locks the front tire, goes careening across the track, plows into the side of David Almanza, who, by the way, was standing in for uh, Joe Kelso, who broke his ankle last week in that freak accident after the uh, murder free race had finished. David Almanza was the stand-in. He was running second on debut. He had an incredible performance um, in in Moto3. Ogden plows into the side of him, takes him out of the race from from second. Ogden was given a double long lap penalty equivalent because it was the final lap of the race. Obviously, there was no time for him to serve that penalty. So instead, he was given a time penalty of six seconds. Um... (sighs) I, I've got to be that guy here. If you were watching on BT Sports coverage. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh, boy. Now, I've mentioned this many a time, that the Vision Track team is owned by Michael Laverty. You mm-hmm. might remember that name. He used to ride in MotoGP and World Superbikes. So, um, him and his brother Eugene. Good people, for the most part. Um, Michael Laverty is also a pundit for BT Sport. He regularly comments and talks about the junior classes in, 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 in bike racing. And I've said before, like there is a big conflict of interest with this that I'm not a fan of personally. That, and even Sylvain Gintoli, who is often a pundit. I mean, now obviously it's fine because Suzuki's not around anymore, but he was a test rider for them and regularly commenting on Suzuki despite the fact he was still on their payroll. I don't that doesn't sit comfortably with me as a pundit. You're not impartial at that point if you're on the payroll. And well like they were looking for any reason to mitigate what Ogden had done. And I saw tweets about this as well from Chaz Davies, who I'm I'm annoyed to, to tick off here because Chaz is a friend of the show. He's he's been on the show before. Um, James Hayden as well. Again, it's it's the boys' club. The boys' club are at it again, and it's just like, oh well, you know, locking the front in the in the wet used to be good hard racing. Fuck off. <laughs> Who? Uh, okay. Okay. Pause. Pause. Said that. Pause. <laughs> locking the front tires. Good hard racing. Did a single soul alive say that when Mark crashed in the opening weekend? Now look. It's in the wet. I know it's easier to lock a brake. I understand Correct. that mitigation. However, Correct. everybody else did just fine. It's not an excuse. Control your vehicle. Everyone everyone was calling for a race ban for that a, a near identical incident a week ago. But yeah. you have to remember, Scott Ogden is not a, a not a quote unquote boring champion. 
and uh, British uh, and, and people, and British people, British sporting people whose entire personality is British domestic motorsport have to be satiated in some way. Well, I mean, they, they, they isn't doing it an F1 for them. They interviewed Ogden after the race and like I said, the six second time penalty wasn't really a penalty because the, the lead, the second group was so far ahead of the rest that the six seconds knocked him down from fourth to fifth. It really didn't affect his race all that much. Um, and they interviewed him after the race, and he said, "Oh well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I took out Almanza, but that's just racing for you." And I'm like, "No, it's not. It's not really racing, is it? It really that, isn't. What he did was ridiculously dangerous. Like that is so dangerous, and it could have really hurt Almanza. And luckily, he was able to to get up and finish the race. And Unfortunately, he finished 17th. He, he will be getting some phone calls later this year. Make no mistake, he rode beautifully in that race. Fair play to the kid. Um, he was fantastic. But he had his race completely ruined by Ogden, completely locking a front brake and losing control of his vehicle. That's bang out of order, and I don't understand why the fucking boys club keeps trying to mitigate anything that comes off a British rider. It's completely ridiculous. <sighs> I mean, it's, it's the same as what we talk about in F1 with the, with Sky supplying the world feed where they are not they're not here to be impartial they're here to drill their narratives into our heads on a, and on it a, really on, sucks on a brief tangent they literally said during that final red flag in F1 this past weekend that Lewis Hamilton's last win was Abu Dhabi 2021 and I'm like <sighs> And everybody thought Red Bull was the bad guys when they boycotted this network. Well, they are. Well, they Hashtag did. Hashtag one fixed. Yeah, I, I find it amazing, right, that a, a TV broadcaster could tell a team that their championship was illegitimate, and then when the team says we don't want to talk to you anymore, they're the bad guys. I find well, this mind-boggling. Perception <laughs> is nine tenths of the law. And if you're bending the perception to make everyone hate these guys, you're not going to get called out on it. It's complete fucking nonsense. And like, like I said, uh, this is someone who generally likes BT Sports coverage. They've done a lot for the overall quality of the broadcasting of this sport because I've, like I said, as much as I love the Eurosport, they didn't have everything. BT Sport has everything, and they have poured a lot of money into this. And I'm glad that they have to an extent. There are there are accessibility issues that I have with the price tag of being on the network, but they generally do a good job. And I, I, I say this as someone that doesn't want to be harsh because there's a lot of good people in that broadcasting network and a lot of people I genuinely respect. Gavin Emmett is someone I've met in person. He's an absolute the d- delightful human being. Um, well, well, Dre. But at the same time, it's it's like they can do better than this. Yeah, Dre, Dre we're not saying it to hate. We're saying no. it because we're asking, like, be better. There's no reason to act like this. If that was a Spaniard that had done what Scott Ogden had done, there would be no way they'd be looking for the same level of mitigation and interviewing him after the race as, as a puff piece saying, oh, well done, Scott, career high finish. How was that for you? Um, and it's, it's doubly frustrating because I also wanted to give a shout out to his teammate, Josh Watley, who became the first black rider, I think in MotoGP history to score a world championship point because he was 15th, oh, that. you know, so it, it's, it's, it, it annoys me because on the one hand vision track, uh, they get a lot of rub of the green because of the national broadcasters, but at the same time, they are also doing something genuinely important and that's giving a black kid a shot. And that might not happen again because unfortunately he isn't a top tier runner in this championship. I'm not sure he ever will be unfortunately, because if you look at his results, they're not great, but he at least will go down in history a little bit. And I, I hope Josh Watley can kick on because he's a very talented rider. Um, and for a sport that has zero diversity in it whatsoever, he's it's pretty homogenous. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he's an important figure and it's just a shame that the environment around it is something that I don't like. And it makes me deeply conflicted as a Viking fan that that even exists. Well, it's not really the team's fault that Ogden made that mistake. No, it's not. And I know no. there's a lot. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot of good people in that team. It's just frustrating that how they're perceived on TV. I, I've, I've said it before about Jake Dixon. 
Jake Dixon is a delightful human being, and he's a genuinely very likable, very New genuine, dad. very, and, and he became a dad this past weekend. Oh, congrats to him and the family. Um, his new daughter Summer was uh, born over the weekend, so congrats to the family. Um, and we saw it, but again, it was mentioned every two seconds when Dixon was on the air. I'm just like, guys, has, has anybody mentioned that Jake Dixon's become a dad? You know, it, it's not been mentioned at all. It's just it, it, it's it, it makes Up the people. Quota. It, it, <laughs> it makes people more cynical about them. I, I know for a fact there are many people on Twitter that love Jake Dixon but hate the coverage he gets, and and it's a shame. I'm one of those people. Yeah, because it's 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 exactly how it plays out, and I don't like it. If they tone down the Brexit vibe just two notches, they'd be seriously likable people. It's just you know now it goes perception, as you say. Is nine tenths of the law. Did any of you know that Luca Marini is Valentino Rossi's half brother? By the way, silence. <laughs> it, it is never met. At least he didn't crash four times this weekend. It's a plus. Actually, it's Mo- a very solid day. MotoGP. He'll be back in a week and a half's time at oh. at the circuit. Before we the, go. Oh, before we go, go on, Cam. So that whole Mark Marquez penalty thing. Oh, this. I, I, I thought to mention before we get out of here. There has been an update. It has gone to the FAM Court of Appeal. Why is that, Dre? Because the stewards feel like they've... The the stewards have basically ran scared. I think they know they're going to lose this case. They've sent it to the FAM Court of Appeals because, as those of you may have missed it, um, as we pointed out, Honda lodged an appeal against the fact that Marquez's penalty was rewritten two days after the fact. Now... Anyone with decent knowledge of the law and how most countries' courtrooms work, it's double jeopardy. It's a classic case of double jeopardy. You cannot be punished twice for the same offense. And technically, if you've changed the language of the punishment, that's Two a days second after it's considered final. Then you've, you've punished someone twice because there's a difference between punishing someone to say you must serve this penalty in Argentina and you must serve this at the next race available. That's not the same. <laughs> and that's a blatant case of double jeopardy. <laughs> Never attribute to malice what can be equally attributed to incompetence because they've also changed how they're starting to word these penalties as a direct result of getting their ass beat in the QRTs for days on end by all of bike Twitter. Yep, and rightfully so. Don't remember, Mark Marquez does deserve his penalty. He should be serving a penalty for what happened. Um, but unfortunately, but, we probably won't now. Yeah, because the FIM effectively took their rule book and wiped their ass with it. And Honda has rightful as, as you know, as any politically savvy organization would do, we go, hey, you have broken all precedent from the past on how you've attributed this penalty to us. We're going to sue you. We'd never be in the spot if they just did their job in the first place. Uh, Too too difficult. Go on, do it. More on that probably in the time we talk about Austin, because that's coming up in a week and a half's time. That's the next round of the MotoGP calendar. We'll be back. We'll be back for that. Um, Circuit of the Americas is always a good one. Welcome to Marquez land. We'll we'll have to wait and see if he can control his brakes this time. Um, Now now featuring 100% less Mark Marquez. Maybe. Maybe. We'll just have to wait and see. We'll, we'll see. Um, get well soon to everybody else involved, especially you and me. Get well soon, big man. Um, we'll be back next episode to talk about IndyCast PPG 375 at Texas. More Texas. Um, we, we, we oh, get- my God. We're getting an actual race of the year contender. I this never is the thought only time I will ever request more Texas. More Texas right after this. I've been Dre Harrison. They've been Cam Buckley and RJ O'Connell. Until next time. Thanks for watching. Sayonara. Later, y'all. Wait, people were watching this? <laughs> we're a visual medium again? Yes, yes. I scrubbed up just, 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 just for the occasion. <laughs> Should have got the memo.